Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Ward, and I'm the Schoolyard and Community Habitats Program Manager at National Wildlife Federation in New York City. Um, thank you so much to Grow NYC for hosting this workshop. Um, yeah, we really, um, I'm so glad that all of you are able to join online in a virtual setting. Um, I am sad we won't be um, together near plants, but I have a lot of beautiful photos of plants and pollinators, so I hope um, we can inspire you. Um, National Wildlife, Federa National Wildlife Federation's mission is to unite all, all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrive in a rapidly changing world. Um, our work supports policies and programs that connect people to nature and work to reverse the decline of wildlife species across the U.S. and around the world. We've also been helping people garden for wildlife since 1973. We support people in creating wildlife gardens at schools, like many of you, at your homes, um, at places of worship, at places of worship, and in communities. Um, two of our main programs that support wildlife gardening are the Garden for Wildlife program and the Schoolyard Habitats program. So, if you are a schoolyard um, school gardener, I encourage you to um, to use this program to make your school to turn your school garden into a schoolyard habitat. And we'll talk about the elements of that during today's presentation. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about gardening um, for pollinators. Um, we're living through a challenging time. And I know for me personally, gardening and spending time in nature and really stopping to observe all of these intricate ecological relationships that sustain all life on earth it's really been grounding for me and it's been a source of solace and healing. So um, my hope is that this presentation can inspire you to notice the little creatures that live amongst us in New York City um, or to plant your own pollinator patch wherever you may be. So here's a brief overview of um, what I'll be talking about today. Um, as Laura mentioned, we'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end, but Feel free to add them in the chat before them and we'll queue them up and have them ready to go when it's time. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll review what is pollination. Um, we'll be talking about pollinator gardens, so let's give ourselves a review of what exactly it is. Um, we'll talk about pollinators um, and there will even be a quiz for all of you. So, um, and then we'll really dig into how to create a pollinator garden um, wherever we may be at home and at school or in a container garden. All right, let's see. Please, um, okay, so just to remind ourselves what is pollination and specifically what its purpose is for plants. Um, Pollination is the act of transferring pollen grains from the male part of a flower to the female part of another flower. So plants, like all living organisms, want to reproduce to create the next generation um, to ensure the survival of the species. So flowers are the reproductive part of the plant. And once a flower is successfully pollinated, once this transfer of pollen happens, um, the pollen, travel, pollen grains travel down a pollen tube and they fertilize the ovule of the flower. When that happens, the plant can, the plant then develops seeds and fruit. So it has, so it's able to reproduce that way. Plants rely on a few different strategies um, to, 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 for this pollen to transfer from one flower to another. Um, many plants are wind pollinated. So in this slide, you'll see a tree, um, flowers from a birch tree in the top right corner, and then flowers from some grasses on the bottom left corner. And both of these plants rely on wind pollination for it to move, to transfer the pollen from flower to flower, from plant to plant. Um, a lot of these wind pollinated plants are the ones that may cause you allergies. So they produce copious amounts of pollen and it travels through the wind and it also gets in our nasal passages and may cause some of us um, distress that way. Another strategy that plants have developed was to, um, to use a pollinator partner to transfer this pollen from one, from one part of the plant to another, to another flower. Um, and that's what we'll really be looking at today. We'll, um, and these are animals, animals and insects and partners that transfer this pollen from one part of the flower to another part of the flower. 
So once these plants are pollinated and they are able to successfully reproduce, um, they will look like this, right? Those, flower, those rose flowers in the top left corner will become the fruit of the rose bush, which, is, which are also known as rose hips. You see the fruit of the birch tree there on the right side and the seeds of the sunflower um, down in the bottom right. So that seed head with all of those seeds that were, um, all of those flowers that were pollinated to produce these seeds. So now that we remind ourselves what is pollination, um, what is a pollinator? Pollinators are animals that move from plant to plant while searching for food. They're looking for pollen, which is really high in protein, and, it, and they feed it to their young, many of them. Or they're also looking for nectar, which is a really sweet, nutritious liquid that gives them energy. As they, as they move from flower to flower looking for this nectar and this pollen, they get dusted with pollen and then they move it to the they move it to the next next flower. So here are here are some common pollinators that you may be familiar with. Um, on the right top right, you can see this bee, and you can see that pollen that's just like stuck all all over his body. So he's covered with it. So when he goes to the next flower, some of that that pollen may get on the female part of the flower, and that flower will be able to reproduce. Um, Hummingbirds, butterflies are also other very common pollinator, animal pollinators that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, let's see, bees, bees, as you all told us, are the most efficient pollinators. In New York City, we have over 230 species of wild bees. Um, but in addition to, to these pollinators that you see here, there's over 100,000 invertebrates that pollinate, that act as pollinators, and over 1,000 mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians that also pollinate flowers across the globe. I'm going to make one comment here about the honeybee. Uh, the honeybee here is in the bottom left corner. Um, and just to kind of distinguish between wild bees and managed bees, so honeybees are managed bees. They're domesticated bees that require humans to help them meet their needs. Um, they've been domesticated by humans for hundreds of years, and, and many, many people refer to them as livestock because we're, we're really getting something out of them and we've domesticated them to serve some of our needs. Um, they are important pollinators, especially in agriculture settings, um, but um, there's new research that also indicates that they may compete with some of our, our wild bees. Um, they may compete for flower resources or they may help spread disease. So there may be, um, they may not be the best kind of pollinators to encourage in certain ecosystems. Um, so today we'll be focusing mostly on these wild pollinators that we'll find in New York City. Um, yeah, but just to kind of like make one more point about the native bees is that they're really highly effective, efficient pollinators. So even if you are in a farm setting or an agriculture setting, if you create the right habitat for them, they can really support um, the, the high, high need um, pollination services that are required for farmlands. And then, of course, hummingbirds are are one of the um, one of the bird um, bird pollinators that we'll see in New York City. Um, all right, it's time for the quiz. So, the quiz is: Am I a pollinator? So, I want you to write your answers in the chat. So, it would just be a yes or no. If you think you know the identity of the of the pollinator or the animal, um, feel free to write that in the chat as well. Um, okay, so is everybody ready? Let me see if I can, let me make sure I can see the chat. Okay, so here's your first one. Am I a pollinator?
Wait, what are we saying? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. So I see a lot of yeses there. So this is a moth and and moths and yes moths are pollinators. Um, there's many species of moths that pollinate flowers. Um, they're um, they don't get as much attention as their more brightly colored cousins, the butterflies. But um, and they're usually but moths are really effective pollinators and many of them are equally beautiful in my opinion. Moths are um, they're more active at night. That might be another reason we don't um, we don't notice them as much. Um, they prefer flowers that are pale or white and that have a heavy aroma. So um, yes to the moths. How's this? Um, can you guys see that big enough if I'm not doing full screen? Okay. So who's this little guy and is, am I a pollinator? All right. Great. You guys are pretty good. Yes. So I see a lot of yeses and yes, um, this is a pollinator and many of you also indicated that this is a wasp and yes, wasps can pollinate. Um, just to make a couple of points is that, you know, for moths and a lot of these species, not all of them will pollinate, but many of them will. So Wasps, um, wasps look like bees, but they are generally not covered in fuzzy hairs, which makes them less efficient pollinators because they're not able to transfer as much pollen from flower to flower. Um, and the wasps also, um, they're predators, so they eat, other, they eat other garden pests or insects. So they don't rely solely on, on nectar or pollen to sustain them. <laughs> All right, next one. Am I a... Some of my pictures might give you some clues, I think, to make these easier. Good job, you guys are good. So yes, this is a pollinator. And I saw, I see, yeah, here's some, some folks answering that yes, this is a beetle and beetles are also pollinators. Um, we, um, we might not think of them as being pollinators, but they are important for a number of plants. Um, just a little bit of trivia is there's more species of beetles on earth than any other insect. So they were the first insect that evolved to pollinate flowers. So you can usually find them on plants that have flowers that are bowl shaped. So one, one common species that you may see are magnolia trees. So they are, they are pollinate, pollinators of magnolia flowers. Um, they're not the most efficient um, pollinators. Again, they really visit the flowers to eat pollen, but they also kind of just hang out there and eat other parts of the plant. So they're not as active moving from flower to flower, which makes them a little bit less efficient. But as you can see from this photo, um, many of them, like the pollen, will get stuck all over their bodies. And if they do go to another flower, there's a chance that it will be pollinated. Okay, next one. Let's see. Okay, am I a pollinator? Okay, so I saw a lot of yeses, but I am I am very sorry to say that squirrels are not pollinators. Squirrels benefit from the fruits of pollinators' labor because they eat seeds and nuts that are, are the result of pollination. 
but no, they are not pollinators. They don't, um, they don't transfer pollen. Um, next one, because I see. All right, what is this? And is this a pollinator? Good shot. Okay. <laughs> so this is kind of a trick question. Um, so I saw that many of you identify this correctly as a caterpillar. And um, Caterpillar, caterpillars don't transfer pollen, but if you think about this species, um, what does it turn into as it goes through metamorphosis and becomes um, an adult is that this will turn into a tiger swallowtail butterfly and butterflies indeed are pollinators. So this was a little bit of a trick question and um, but it's also just an adorable looking caterpillar. So we had to include this little guy. Next one, is this a pollinator? Am I a pollinator? Great, thanks for all the honesty, not sure. Yes, yes. So this is a fly and flies are two weak two winged insects and yes they are also pollinators again not all flies will be pollinators so some of our house flies are not pollinators but but there are many flies that also pollinate our flowers um some of them are even bee mimics so they look like bees and you probably would think they were a bee if you saw them on on a flower but um flies are important pollinators um and just one note is that we should all be thankful for flies as pollinators because they they pollinate one of the most important food plants on earth which is the cacao plant which is the main ingredient for chocolate so there's a tiny midge fly that pollinates um pollinates cocoa so um, we should all be grateful for them. Yeah, this picture might give you some clues, but am I a pollinator? Yep, you're all correct. This is a pollinator. Bats are important pollinators, um, especially in tropical and desert climates. Um, the bats we find around here in the eastern U.S. are not pollinators, but there's a lot of, there's over 300 species of fruit, of fruit that depend on bats for pollination. So that includes some important food crops that we eat, like bananas, mangoes, and guavas. And here's the last one, last question of the quiz. Am I a pollinator? Maybe not this individual, but we can um assume she represents humans right or she represents all humans so are humans pollinators great yeah good sometimes um is actually the correct answer so we didn't evolve um physical with physical adaptations that were designed to help pollinate flowers, but we often, um, we do pollinate flowers. So um, we facilitate the pollination of plants, right? Is that um, one way we do that is we manage honeybees and we can bring honeybees to, to fields to have them pollinate, pollinate specific crops. Um, but we can also manually pollinate flowers with, um, with a paintbrush or with a toothpick or some other, um, some other technical device that we can do that as well. Because some parts of the world, like pollinators have um, really declined. So they can't even pollinate some of their crops and they have to do it by hand. Um, yeah, and maybe some of you even have um, hydroponic systems in your in your class, and you may have to at times pollinate some of the crops that you've got growing there. So. Great, thanks everybody for participating in the quiz. Um, I appreciate that of everybody playing along and doing such a great job.
Um, so just a quick note about why pollinators are important, and we've touched upon this when we think about plant reproduction, um, but they really do support the health of the planet and ecosystems in so many direct and indirect ways. Um, like we've mentioned before, animals rely on seeds, the nuts, and fruit, which develop as a result of plant reproduction. Um, and even humans, we, we rely a lot on food crops that are pollinated by um, by animals. Um, one piece of trivia that often gets repeated is that pollinators are responsible for one in three bites of food that we eat. So our apples, our blueberries, our tomatoes, um, they're all dependent on pollinators. Even if you eat meat, um, the cattle will eat clover and alfalfa or other greens that are insect pollinated. Um, so pollinators themselves then can become food for other animals. So if you picture a food web or a food chain, you can see kind of who eats who and then, you know, who might be eating, eating a bee or eating a pollinator. So, um, so they're all, they're really important for the health of ecosystems. And of course, like most of our environmental issues, there's bad news when it comes to pollinators. Um, so in recent decades, population of pollinators have declined at really alarming rates. Um, and there's many reasons for this. Um, habitat loss or the destruction of habitat is a big one. So all wildlife, including, um, including pollinators, they need places to feed, to nest, and to rest. And we've eliminated so much, um, so much habitat due to agriculture or human activities. Even our lawns create these kind of ecological dead zones that, um, that really don't support any sort of um, ecological relationships. Um, maybe you saw this report or this article that came out a couple of years ago about the insect apocalypse. It's a lot of depressing news, <laughs> but um, it estimates that half of all insects may have been lost since 1970, and over 40% of the 1 million known species of insects are facing extinction right now. So, um, yeah, it's some, there's some bad news, um, and I'll just make a note that pesticides also play a big part in um, in in threats to pest, um, threats to pollinators. So. They, you know, any, any chemical that's designed to kill one type of insect will really have harmful effects on every other living thing that's around it. So, yeah, but there's hope, okay? <laughs> this is why we're all here. It's why you joined this webinar. So there is hope and um, we can help pollinate. There's a lot of ways that we can help pollinators in cities. Um, recent, recent research reveals that cities can play an important part in reversing this decline. Um, cities can really support a diversity of pollinators. We can create habitat at schools, at homes. Um, pollinators don't need a ton of space to find what they need. So they can, so we can create these patches and try to connect them as best we can. And pollinators will be able to kind of traverse through the city and find everything that they need. Now we'll really get into sort of like how we can do this um, at our homes or at our schools or wherever we, um, wherever we are. So how can we create a pollinator garden? So all living things on earth require a few things to survive. This is um, all wildlife um, and all humans actually will need this too. So um, pollinator, to create a pollinator habitat, pollinators require food. Um, and for pollinators, plants are food. Um, the flowers with nectar are food. The, the flowers with pollen are food for the bees. Um, the leaves of particular plant species are food. Um, are food for are food for a number of um, of our caterpillars that become moths and um, moths and butterflies. Pollinators also need water. Yeah, we don't think of they're so little, so so you may not think of them as needing water to drink, but they do. And there's a number of ways that you can provide water for pollinators in your garden. Um, I love some of these things because 
sometimes um, you may have mosquitoes in, in your area or in the garden and you don't want to leave out a lot of standing water. So these are some great ways that you can provide water for pollinators. Um, you can take a dish or a bird bath and um, fill it with water, some shallow, a shallow amount of water, and then put in rocks or marbles like in this photo um, because that provides a landing pad for bees and so they can access some water and drink the water. Same thing with butterflies, um, they get minerals from water. So again, when it's a shallow puddle or a small amount of water, the minerals can really concentrate and so they'll be able to drink from these areas too. Again, you can use a, a dish, but there's also even um, things called puddling dishes that you can also purchase. Um, they're cute things to add to your garden. Um, they also need, pollinators also need cover or protection from the elements and predators. So again, plants really provide most of these things for pollinators. They can get under the leaves or pine, pine needles um, to, to, for protection against um, rain or wind. Um, a lot of species of butterflies will also kind of create their, um, their chrysalis under the leaf, um, under a leaf for some extra protection protection. Um, another thing that you may not um, think about when you're creating a pollinator garden is, um, is the leaves too. So a lot of our butterfly and moss species, they spend winter um, kind of hibernating and so they'll, they'll, um, they'll, they'll make their pupae in, in, in leaf litter. So if you're raking up all of those leaf piles and then throwing them out or putting them somewhere else, you're also discarding some of the species of, of, of butterflies and moths. So this leads to, and um, we'll talk about this in, this in one moment, but pollinators also need places to raise their young. Um, many of our native bees are solitary species, so they're not social, they don't live together in hives. Um, instead, they build their nests in soil or in the hollow stems of plants um, or even in wood in the case of um, carpenter bees. So therefore, it's important to leave some bare patches of soil. Um, so you can see these bees in this slide that are burrowing holes into the soil um, so that they can make their nests in the soil. So yeah, so it's good not to use a ton of mulch because they won't be able to access that soil as well. Um, the other thing that they may need to raise their young are these specific host plants, right? So caterpillars will eat, when they're in their larval stage as, as caterpillars, they'll eat um, specific species of plants. So in this example, a very famous example, we know about the monarch butterfly and monarchs lay their eggs on, on milkweed plants and that is the only species of plant that um, that a monarch caterpillar will, will eat. So we, um, we want to provide those, um, those elements for pollinators in a garden as well. And then we also want to make sure that we're using sustainable practices. So this, this kind of goes back to like leaving, leaving the leaves for wildlife, right? Um, just so they can overwinter there in the leaves and we're not just like inadvertently throwing them away. Um, and then again, kind of referring to the, um, the use of pesticides. So don't spray chemicals in the garden because um, that has harmful effects on, on many species of our wildlife, um, including pollinators. You can also leave things like um, don't cut back your plants in the winter and leave those up um, those, for those bees that will make nests in the hollow stems of our perennial plants especially. Okay, I'm going to skip this one just because I'm running out of time. Um, so it's really important to choose native plants um, because of this, um, because plants and, and wildlife have co, plants and native plants and wildlife have co-evolved over hundreds of thousands of years. Um, native plants are more adapted to the climate, they're more drought resistant, and then they've also developed these adaptations um, where like the monarch, for example, will its young will only eat milkweed plants. Um, to give you one example of this kind of um, 
relationship between plants and wildlife is that a native wild, white oak will support over 530 species, species of caterpillars, of butterflies, and moths. Um, and then a ginkgo tree, another common tree that we plant um, on, as street trees or all over our cities, it will, it's a non-native and it will only support one species of caterpillars. So um, this is not a chickadee, but to think about, um, so these caterpillars are especially important to birds, um, especially important to birds as they're raising their young. One chickadee will require um, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to feed one brood of hatchlings. So really, really important. I'm gonna share these resources with you after, but these are a few resources to help you select plants for your pollinator patch. So these are some native wildflowers that will support, that provide high quality nectar and high value to pollinators. So they're gonna be nectar species. A lot of them are also um, host plants for, cat, for butterflies as well. And National Wildlife Federation also has a native plant finder where you can plug in your zip code and it will tell you um, some of the most beneficial plants that you can um, that you can plant in your area too. So um, it will sort things by their their value to wildlife. So it might some of those trees and shrubs might come up first because if you think back to that slide, um, thinking about all of the wildlife species that a tree will support. Uh, I won't read everything on this slide, but really um, just a couple of things to consider when you're designing or creating a, a pollinator garden is that um, these host plants and nectar plants, it's great to add a little, po a little pollinator patch if you grow food in your garden because that will support the pollination of all your food. And um, just really understand what your plant needs and understand your site too. Is it full sun? Is it part shade? Um, so don't plant shade loving plants if you have full sun in your garden. Um, and then I guess really importantly is just don't be discouraged if a plant doesn't survive. Um, this is an opportunity to learn. You can learn more about um, what that plant needs to succeed. You can learn more about its, um, some of its adaptations for survival. So it's, yeah, it's okay. Just sort of like, don't, don't put too much pressure on it. But <laughs> yeah, it's a great opportunity to learn and observe some of the pollinators. Um, and if you do provide food, water, cover, and places for pollinators to raise their young, you should certify your garden as an official wildlife habitat. And you can certify your schoolyard as well. You'll get a sign that looks just like this, but it says schoolyard habitat. So it's a great, um, it makes a great outdoor classroom and places for students to observe and learn and to really um, foster their curiosity. I'm running out of time because I want to make sure there's enough for enough time for questions. So um, if you don't have space for to create a garden, there's other ways that you can connect to pollinators in New York City. Um, our parks, our botanical gardens, our community gardens um, will have, have a lot of plants that support pollinators. So I encourage you just to see what's local so you can safely visit if that's, in, if that's available to you right now. But um, these are um, some photos of Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. This is the Naval Cemetery at the Brooklyn Navy Yard on the top right. So there's a lot of these places. All of our major parks will have some natural areas with a lot of flowering plants. Um, this, I don't know if I should play my video. Um, this is only a minute long and then maybe I'll stop right there. I'll talk over this too, just to, um, this is just to encourage you to like really get up close with some of the pollinators. Um, I know this may show up choppy to you, but um, bees especially are very gentle and they do not <laughs> mind if you get really close to them with a, with a cell phone and take photos of them. Um, 
and you can get some really good shots of them pollinating. These are all in my backyard. I'm lucky to have a backyard garden. So check out the pollen baskets there on that guy. Um. I will, I'm going to skip this slide and make sure you get some info about it in the, um, in the follow-up email. But the last thing I'll say is certainly thank you. And if you are a teacher, um, we, um, National Wildlife Federation in New York City, will be publishing an urban pollinator curriculum um, in the fall. And so we will definitely make this available for free as a PDF to teachers. And it will, um, it will take you through activities that that you, you and your students can observe pollinators or can really like learn um, learn deeply about them. So um, thank you. I'm going to stop there so I have time for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was great. We do have quite a few questions to get through. Um, and if we don't get to everyone's question today, we'll make sure that we follow up and answer them in a blog post, which you'll get in the follow up email. But one that has come up a couple times is what creative ideas do you recommend for people living in apartments that maybe don't have a, a backyard garden space and how can they plant for pollinators? Someone asked about window box gardening. Okay, yeah, so all of the, a lot of plants um, in that one um, plant guide that we'll send you, a lot of those can also be grown in containers and pots or containers. Um, some of them, some of those native plants, they need a little bit more room than a window box for their root space, so they may not work. But a couple of plants that I think would look, work really well in a window box are, um, forgive me because I only, I know most of these plants by their botanical names. So um, one is Phlox divericata, which is flowering right now. Um, it has like a profusion of lavender or pink colored flowers. And so this is an early pollinator species that, um, yeah, so all of these like spring, once pollinators emerge in the spring, they'll have some food. Another one that I think does really well in window boxes is um, it's called wild petunia and it's really drought tolerant. So one thing to keep in mind when you're um, planting in containers and window boxes is that the soil will dry out so much quicker um, than plants in the ground. So you really have to, um, you have to make sure they stay watered. But that wild petunia, if you're a little bit forgetful, it might, <laughs> it might work well in a window box. I've tried it before. Um, another one is a wild geranium, which is also blooming right now, too. Really tough plant, but beautiful, delicate flowers. That sounds great for containers and window boxes. Um, and we will be sending out the presentation and all of the resources. So some people were asking for like that map of, of things um, and the links to the pollinator plants that you can find in your area that are native. Okay, so next question. Can you uh, explain again how honeybees are managed or why you called them domesticated? Um, yeah, so um, honeybees, like there are some wild, um, wild colonies of honeybees, but not, I don't, I mean, they will make a, um, let me, let me start over there. So um, I guess if you just think about domestic animals in general, so um, even using the dog as an example, right, is that um, we suspect that dogs were domesticated from, wild, from wolves or some other wild species of dogs. So this is just humans over a long period of time, sort of like um, keeping them close by and then managing, um, managing them for, for their own needs. So humans like honeybees because we harvest the we harvest the honey and we can use the honey for other purposes. So we've always been really attracted to the honey. And 
if you've ever seen a honeybee hive, um, they can contain up to about 50,000 bees in one hive. And um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways. I'm not a honey beekeeper, so I'm not like really able to answer the question really well, but, um, but it's a good research question if you want to just think about how honeybees were domesticated and when that really happened. Um, I know that Europeans brought them over when they came to North America. So it is, they are, um, they are not native to North America. They're um, European natives. Cool. Um, someone asked, uh, where did it go? Do you have any tricks for getting milkweed seeds to grow? I know this can be kind of like a, there's like a whole cold process or something like that. Yeah, um, the, yeah, great question. And I can tell you're a gardener <laughs> there. I don't have any tricks because I've never, um, I've never been successful in getting milkweed seeds to germinate, if I'm being totally honest. So they do need that, that cold period um, where they, like, so if you think about just the, the natural life cycle of a plant, um, they'll, they'll flower um, maybe in the spring or the summer, and then they'll make seeds or fruit. And those seeds, like, hang around all winter, and then they wouldn't normally germinate until the weather warms up or after specific conditions that those, um, that plant needs. So, um, yeah, I'd say just keep trying and make sure that they go through a cold period. It might be interesting to even try some that you direct so outside and really able, you know, remember where you put it or put it in a container outside all winter and then do some that you stratify inside um, with the refrigerator or another cold method. But um, yeah, I wish I was more successful. I've always kind of bought them as um, plugs. Yeah, I've heard of putting them in the fridge for a month and then planting them in the early spring. Um, and then a kind of a related question that I might be able to answer as well um, is where to get native plants and if Grow NYC is giving any out this year. We are not giving out any native plants this year, unfortunately, although we're hoping eventually we'll be able to get back and doing giveaway events. Um, we have a list of plant nurseries around New York City that we can give out. The place we've sourced them from in the past is the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. They have a salt lot nursery where they do all native plants. Um, and if you're a school gardener, you get a 35% discount. They're currently operating. You can do like a social distance pickup from them. But there's a bunch more that we can follow up in the email. And, and I would also add to, I, I don't want to create more work for you, but um, go to your local nursery and just ask them um, because if there's a real interest in native plants they can start carrying them and so sometimes they can even order things just special for you as well but i think the more that nurseries know that people want native plants and they'll start carrying more all right someone has a question about um one of the design features you mentioned was keeping a tiny bit of water but not enough for mos to like attract mosquitoes um, and they're a little nervous about doing that because uh, they've seen mosquitoes lay in just a tiny bit of water before. Um, but they're also nervous to use mosquito tablets or mosquito dunks. So do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so mosquito larvae need, I don't know exactly how many days they need, but if um, they need a few days um, to become adults, so if you if you had a bird if you have a bird bath or you set up a butterfly puddler or something like that, just clean out the water every every two days so that it's not it's not sitting there, and that really will wash away any larvae that's in there. Um, yeah, mosquitoes are a real problem. I I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we actually had a couple of gardeners respond to the milkweed question who have successfully germinated. Oh, so good! Yes. So this person had success with keeping the seeds one month in the freezer and then two weeks in the fridge. <clears throat> That's what else said, you can plant milkweed seeds in a milk bottle and leave them outside in March, put holes in the bottom so they don't rot, and they are coming up in the bottle currently. So that worked for them as well. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. And also someone else said you can direct some milkweed in the fall and then 
hopefully the conditions will be right for them to come back. All right, we have time for probably just one more question, um, but we do have more, so we'll make sure we follow up with everyone's questions in writing in the follow-up. So if someone has a school garden in like a shady area, are there any pollinator plants that are good for shady areas or under like street trees, places that don't get full sun? Yeah, um, I'll just make one note that um, street trees can be really hard to plant and many of you may know just because they get those, you know, there's dogs and cars and salt that really make it hard for plants to grow. But if you're able to, to really attend to those plants, they can be really successful. Um, but yes, there are some um, plant species that will grow in the shade that are great for pollinators and um, a lot of them are early spring flowering. Um, so some of my favorite types of plants are known as spring ephemerals in that they um, they will usually, they're, they're native to woodlands or forest areas and they usually bloom and make their seeds before, um, before trees leaf out. So they take advantage of all of the, the resources of the sun like early in the spring while they have it. And so some of them are like understory plants. So a couple that tolerate the shade are wild, wild geranium is another one. It'll tolerate um, shade, um, sun, it's really tough. Um, columbine, which is blooming right now, is another great one that those phlox species that I mentioned earlier are great ones. Um, and then there's also, there's some great native ones that are a little bit harder to cultivate in the garden, but um, like bloodroot or trout lilies, they're all early spring and they're really gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. Um, the other thing is that think about um, some shrubs and trees. They can also, they also have flowers that um, pollinators are attracted to. So some blueberry bushes can tolerate a little bit of shade. So, um, and they have like their bees love them. And then you have some delicious fruit as well. All right, that sounds great. Um, so I'm gonna do uh, one last poll just to see um, how you all are planning to get involved in helping your pollinator habitats around the city. Um, so it's what are ways you can help pollinators besides creating or in addition to creating pollinator gardens. Um, don't use pesticides, participate in pollinator citizen science, spread the knowledge about pollinators or all of the above. Um, and so, we got some voting going on. Maybe you have a specific one you really want or you want to do all of them, but there is no wrong answer. So I'm gonna end the polling. It looks like a lot of you are planning to get involved um, in helping your native pollinators. Um, okay, so that is our workshop for today. We hope you can um, Join us for our upcoming Grow NYC virtual events. And just want to give one last huge thank you to Sarah for presenting um, and to National Wildlife Federation for co-hosting. And a big thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to end the meeting now, and we hope to see you at our next workshop.